Church family and those watching online, it has been quite the week. <laughs> On Friday, uh, our president uh, declared it's a state of national emergency. Uh, COVID-19 has definitely affected America. Uh, I consider our, our kids' school, I don't know about your kids, but they're off until April 6th. I consider the European travel ban and those who have traveled canceled uh, their, their, their travel plans, whether it be to uh, California or Disney World. I consider all the canceled events, um, whether it be uh, Winter Jam on Friday, whether it be March Madness, the rest of the NBA season, and even opening day for the Cubs and the Sox. It's been quite a week. I, I kind of am reminded of what's happening in Italy, and maybe you know that they have been on quarantine for such a time. And, and right now you can see some uh, crazy images of, of very populated areas, usually desolated uh, or deserted. You can si find pictures of the Colosseum with no one around, and, and St. Peter's Cathedral, and no one there, and, and the bridges of Venice, and just deserted. And I consider um, what we might get into in the coming weeks here in America. Um, we might have kids who are telling mom, I, I miss my friends. And maybe even coworkers who long to go back to work. Um, in all of this to start out, I wanted to assure you that you have reason for peace. This past week I produced a video and uh, gave one of my favorite sections of scripture. It's a section from the psalmist who said this, that surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. What do you need to know about God right now is he's holding you in the palm of your hands, his hands, and has a great wing that he shields you with right now. He is the same God who chose your birthday. You didn't choose it. And he's the God who will plan when and how he wants to take us from this life. He's in control right now. We have reason for peace. And while all of this is true, what we may experience, though, in the coming weeks are the effects of isolation. Uh, what we may experience is uh, a little bit what I want to talk about today of feelings of loneliness. In fact, before COVID-19, do you know we as a people were already becoming more isolated? Uh, studies have shown that in the European Union, 34% uh, of the households have only one individual living them. So again, 34% of people, one, one person living at home. In Canada, that's 28%. In America, we're taking a census, and I, I bet when it comes out, we'll find that not only do we have diminished households, but we'll also find an increase of people living all by themselves. The world is increasingly isolated. For a long time, we've recognized that uh, social media does not make us more social. And that more and more, uh, it, it's hard to have lasting friendships. The, the type of people you have in your inner circle and even expanded circle are, are less and less and less. Welcome to 2020. Some have even said that uh, there is an epidemic of loneliness. Now, I did some research on the difference between pandemic and epidemic. Uh, for your information, a pandemic is something that spreads not just in one area, but all over. And so um, because I, I think this is, uh, isolation is such a problem, we could probably say there's a pandemic of isolation as well. And what does it mean for us? What are the effects of feeling lonely? Uh, medical doctors have compared... Um, being alone or lonely uh, to the equivalent of smoking. In fact, they've found that mortality rates go up 26% if you're feeling lonely. The University of UCLA, they did some research, and this is what they found. Uh, they found that social isolation triggers cellular changes that result in chronic inflammation, predisposing the lonely to serious physical conditions like heart disease, stroke, metastatic cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. It's a serious pandemic, being isolated. This past week, I gathered as a circuit meeting of pastors, and I heard from another pastor who lived in the North Woods, and he could go days without seeing anyone. And he, and he just told us that after those days, he felt an effect. And so what do we learn right now, and 
what are we going to talk about? Our first takeaway is this, that we need each other. No, no matter how independent you, you think you are or how much you pull your, yourself up by your bootstraps, the, the, the reality is God made you to be interdependent. You can't go it alone. In fact, when it goes back to Italy, um, I, I don't know if you saw this video, but uh, one of the greatest videos was that of uh, all the Italians in, in Siena, and they were locked inside, but they sang in the street. And even though they can see each other, they, they filled this alley with noise, basically telling their neighbors, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And you and I, um, who know the Lord, and welcome, by the way, if you're new to the Lord, we hear his word, and, and it tells us that he made us for each other. See, way back when, in, in the very beginning, when he created Adam, um, he also created Eve. And I want to draw you to that account. Uh, when everything was perfect, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And if you read those beginning uh, chapters of Genesis, um, he was calling everything good. He was saying the sky is good, and the stars are good. And the veggies are good, and the animals are good. I mean, he was just saying it was good all over the place. And when he comes to this section, it's kind of like the scratching of a needle on a record. Not good? Yeah, not good to be isolated. Not good to be alone. And so what does he do? He sets out and he makes, and I wish I could use the, the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word means counterpart. And I know it's more clumsy, but I like the picture a little better because he never meant subordinate. He never meant not equal. One thing you should know and our society should know is that men and women are completely equal in God's eyes. The same value. How wonderful. If our whole society got that and we could stop fighting about better and worse. We are equal in God's eyes. Co-equal and co-heir. We both will reign with the Lord. But what he did make, he made different. And that's what counterpart clearly demonstrates. Um, and we don't have to fight the fact that we are different. You don't have to fight the fact that, that you can go to a marriage and, and your spouse, you might have thought you were like, but you're really different, aren't you? Yeah, God intended it that way. Not so that there would be some friction between you, but actually so that there'd be a complement between you, so that there'd be different gift sets and different skill sets so you can do more together. How, how wonderful is this? God made us for each other. But that is also why if we leave from home as college students do or go and get our own job, or if we lose a relationship, maybe through divorce, through death. It's the reason that we experience such loneliness. Because we were made to walk so intimately with someone else. Now, we're going to turn our attention towards Jesus. And something I love about God's plan is that to save the world, Jesus became just like us. 100% human, 100% God. And what that means for us is that he has all the feels. There is no emotion that you can feel that he can't relate to or feel himself. And what we're going to take a look at is one of the most lonely periods in Jesus' life. So, so during this series, we've been following Jesus on his journey to the cross, and it's going to get really lonely for him now. We're going to hear of how in his hour of need, the disciples just flee and desert him. So let's get into it. It's right after he prayed in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane. And, and, and now he is being uh, captured by the authorities. And we see the disciples' reaction um, from Matthew chapter 26. You can follow along on the screen your worship folder. So then men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But then, how would scriptures be fulfilled that say it would happen this way? I love this section because in the hour that it seems like maybe Jesus is losing control, and people are taking control of him as they arrest him and chain him, 
he is still verifying to his disciples and everyone else there, hey, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still reigning right now. <laughs> I still got this covered. In fact, what we know from other accounts is the ear that was cut off, he just like touches it back and it's healed. Like, yeah, I'm God. Try that one. So he's assuring us that, that again, he's in control. Uh, but, but, but look at where he's going to get lonely. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And the reaction, all the disciples deserted him and fled. The time where he has to do his hardest work, he's got no help. They all leave. Powerful word. As we continue... Could you turn to someone next to you and say, I'm here for you? I'm here for you. And if you're watching online, we're here for you. We've got to talk about this a little bit. You know, I was doing some research over the things that you shouldn't do alone, and I, I found some interesting answers. Um, one of them uh, was that you should never go to a sit-down or a romantic restaurant alone. I guess I'd agree with that. I've, I've never been to the melting pot by myself, but I assume that wouldn't be as fun, <laughs> right? Um, another one, this was controversial, uh, is uh, you shouldn't watch a movie alone. And, and this is a little bit controversial because I want to ask you, how many have ever gone to the movie theaters alone? Yeah. Do you know, actually, I prefer sometimes being alone? Like, I don't need to hear someone else chewing popcorn to get engaged with a good movie, right? You know, it, anyway. But, but I, I think I've found the absolute worst thing to do alone, and, and maybe some will agree with me, it is moving. <laughs> moving when you're by yourself is the absolute worst. I've been there, you know, uh, checking into a dormitory, checking into an apartment, and I've had cars full or vans full, and it doesn't matter how many boxes you have. When you're alone, it seems like there's millions. It seems like it's tenfold. Right? And, and everything that you carry is just wearisome and burdened. If you have even one helper, it is exponentially easier to move. It's incredible. And when you move alone, you do crazy things. Not only do you carry each box, but what happens is you start carrying things that you probably shouldn't carry all by yourself. If you've ever been there. I remember uh, getting to the dormitory. I had this carpet that was going to fill the entire room. And so this was a large carpet. But the room was on the fourth floor, and I still remember laboring up four flights with this carpet. I don't know where everyone was, you know, if this was like Italy or whatnot, but it was just crazy. No one was there to help me. It was laborsome. I remember tube televisions. I had this big tube television and paid the cost of buying such a big TV. And, and they were heavy, friends. And, and then you're carrying this big thing up those stairs. And I draw this out because it's not just when you move, but I think one of the reasons you can feel lonely is when you don't have help, right? And so this is uh, for, for you. If, if you've been at work and everyone else left, right, and you're still there, you know how that feels. You know when everyone else said, you know, I'm done with my part of the project. You're out. You know how that feels, Right? If you had someone that you counted on to do this or that for you, and then they leave you and you're stuck with it, figuring it out and never doing it before, you know this feeling. And one of the greatest things about this whole series is Jesus comes on and he says, yeah, I've been there. Because look at the account. Jesus is going to the cross. He's accomplishing the salvation of mankind. This is way more than a move. This is way more than a good project. This is what everyone's hopes are pinned upon. And how does he have to do it? Completely alone. In fact, again, the, the key verse uh, said, all the disciples deserted him and fled. In fact, what we know in other accounts, there's one disciple who left his garment there. So, so get this, he would rather be naked than stay by Jesus. That's crazy. And what we know is that he will go off to court where he's falsely accused and he has no friend sticking up for him. He'll be flogged and he'll be mocked and he'll have none of the disciples saying, don't mock the king. Do you know he op raised the dead and opened the eyes of the blind? Nothing. It's silent. 
He has to accomplish the greatest work all by himself. In fact, you know, we can't add to the salvation of Jesus. There, there's not a good work you can do. There's not anything so noble that will add a shred to the work of your salvation. Do you know that? He has to do it alone. And so Paul would say that through the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteous. Not through the obedience of many men, but the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteous as he goes to the cross. Alone. But if you've ever been in a situation where the burden of accomplishing something, whether it be raising children in an infancy or the financial burden of your household, if you've ever felt that pressure and felt like no one understands, Jesus says, yeah, I do. If you're ever wondering, like, how am I going to get help because I'd really like some help here and, and it seems like you're just stuck, Jesus says, yeah, yeah I get it. And what I want to talk about next, if you've ever had the feeling where, where someone promised something or you're counting on someone and they didn't fulfill that, Jesus has been, yeah, I know that one too. Because it gets worse for Jesus. Or it is worse for Jesus. And to bring this up, I wanted to talk about a very famous traitor. You, you probably know his name even before I um, mention his story, but ha have you heard of uh, Benedict Arnold? A little bit of his story, he was uh, born in, in the States, uh, born in Connecticut, and George Washington trusted him so much that he was at West Point in New York, which, which you still know uh, if you know the Army. And, and he was in charge of, of that fortress during the Revolutionary War when it was found out that he had plotted to hand over that fort to the British. Now, now when it was found out, um, he fled the fort and he went to the British forces, and, and, and then he led the British forces against his old troops. And I can't imagine what it would be to see your commander, your chief, the one who trained you, the one who told you the tactics, to now use that same training and tactics against you. I can't imagine what it would be a, a soldier fighting against your former commander. That, that, that would be so weird, right? A lighter example of this, if you grew up in Wisconsin and maybe are a Packers fan, this thing really felt the same, right? Should not be. Now, Jesus, he's not only going alone, but you need to know what happened before he got there. Before he got there, one of the chosen 12 named Judas, look what he's doing. While still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. For he was the catalyst for Jesus being captured. And with him was a, a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged with a signal, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him. And you think of the intimacy of a kiss to be the sign of betrayal. Jesus even commented of this. By a kiss, Judas? And so it's, it's not just that he goes alone. It's that he's been betrayed. One of his hand-picked disciples is the one who releases him for some money. In fact, you can feel lonely also when, when those you count on betray you. And let's face it, this will all happen to us. There's going to be someone in your life that makes a promise to you that they do not fulfill. There's going to be someone in your life that if it hasn't happened yet, promised to walk by your side but then couldn't, or maybe deserted you. This is a common experience. And it's not just what happens between Jesus and Judas. It's also what happens between Jesus and Peter. See, earlier in this, he told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me. And what does Peter say? No, no, Jesus. I love you so much. I would die with you, Jesus. And Peter, known for having a loud voice, went in front of a little girl saying, are you one of the disciples uses his loud voice not to defend his knowledge of Jesus, but to deny him. Cursing and swearing, I don't know the man. If you've ever been betrayed and deserted, stabbed in the back, Jesus says, I know this one. That's a tough one. 
But finally, I, I think what's so hard is that no one understands. And in fact, we see this in the account. When, when Peter draws his sword and cuts off the ear, it's exemplifying the fact that he doesn't know what's going to go down. Even though Jesus had tried to tell his disciples three times that he not only had to die, but that he was going to rise again, and yet they just don't get it. It reminds me of Palm Sunday. And we'll celebrate that in, in a couple Sundays. But as he comes in that day, Jesus is riding in, and, and he knows the same voices that say, Hosanna, blessed be the son of David, are the same voices that are going to yell crucify. And only he gets what's going on right now. Now, now why this matters for you is we're all in situations where sometimes we have an experience we can't even put into words for someone else to understand. Like we don't have words to label it. Or sometimes we have conversations with people and they give us the blank stare and by what they said and, and they're kind-hearted, but, but you kind of tell that they didn't get it. Not exactly. And while that's your experience with other people, it is not your experience with God. God is the one who understands when no one else does. The one who says, me too. As I consider all the reasons for loneliness and deserting God, I consider my relationship with God. And how many times I've left him just like these disciples. How many times instead of helping the kingdom of God and being a light, I have hidden my light. How many times that I preach something that is so much easier to preach than it is to practice. And so I betray the word that I say. How many times I don't understand my God. And rather than accepting his way through faith, I judge him. And I say, God, you should acquiesce to my understanding. What about you? Are there times where you too do not practice what you preach? Times where you do not fulfill the vows that you've made? Times where you've left him because he didn't make sense to you? Friends, he's so much better than us. Do you know what I love about Jesus? All of this is happening and he goes anyway. All of this is going to happen and he sets out resolutely for Jerusalem. What I love about Jesus is that his activity towards me is not contingent upon my activity towards him. It's not a tit for tat. It's not reciprocation. It's rather just that he chose to love me so he goes. And this one would go alone so he could assure you and I that we'd never be alone. The one of willing to be abandoned by his father so that you and I could hold on to this promise that says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, says our God. This one who gives us the full rights of sons and daughters, no matter how many vows we haven't fulfilled, says we're still in his family. How great is our God. You know, there's this passage that says, if we are faithless, he is faithful, for he cannot disown himself. He can't be anything other than a promising, fulfilling, good God. That's the God that we have. But how might he, in the meantime, answer our experience of loneliness, not just through, through me too, but through some other precious promises? I think we need to double down on that. The peace we can have in isolation and the comfort we can have. And, you know, to talk about this, I want to talk a little bit about teachers. You know, it's interesting. We've all been to school, and, and there's a spectrum of teachers. There are teachers that are either a little bit more absent-minded, that you can get away with stuff in their class, or teachers that don't let you get away with anything. Like, they have, like, hidden cameras and eyes in the back of their head. Yeah, I always love the stories of the absent-minded professors. I, I remember hearing from, you know, college and seminary professors of guys who would, like, try to do push-ups on the desk while their back was turned. Um, I, I heard of dances that went on and throwing of a ball and all of that kind. The best that I ever heard is someone who snuck out of the window of a classroom while the professor didn't notice because he was up there. That's great. But, but then there's the other professors that, that, again, are so in tune, they know the minute that you've clocked out, and they call on you, right? You ever been there? 
Like, I was in tune the whole time, and now you call on me? <laughs> in fact, uh, old school, but I, I had some professors that if they knew you weren't paying attention, they would chuck an eraser at your head. Um, I'm pretty sure you can't do that anymore. There's not a conference session on chucking erasers, but uh, it's a different time, friends. <laughs> I bring this up because what is our God? Is our God right now absent-minded? Like right now, he's turned his back, and that's the reason there's COVID-19. That's the reason all these things happen, because God is just, well, he's kind of sleepy, and maybe we should wake him up, right? In fact, because God is this way, maybe we should try to do whatever we want, because he doesn't see anyway, right? Now, let me ask you, is that our God? Absolutely not. He's so in tune. He's got eyes everywhere, not just in the back of his head. He is everywhere. But for our good. In fact, I want to tell you an Old Testament story. It's of a gal named Hagar. And the story starts with Abraham, who was promised to have a child. And yet this child wasn't coming. Abraham had to wait for years and years and years. And so in the meantime, um, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah had this wise idea. Uh, Sarah said, you know, I have this maidservant. Maybe the child was supposed to come through the maidservant. So Abraham, why don't you sleep with my maidservant? And that's how it will be. Now, it wasn't a good idea. And Abraham wasn't a good leader. He didn't stand up. He gave in. and They came together. When the plan worked and Hagar got pregnant, but, but then Sarah wasn't so happy about the plan that she had ordained. And, and, and so she got really mad. She was jealous at Hagar. She's pregnant and I'm not. And Abraham didn't know what to do. He basically said, you know, you, you do what you think is right. So Sarah mistreated Hagar. And it got so bad for her that this pregnant lady had to run from her home and run from her house. And, and she was in a desert And you think of how she felt in those moments. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I didn't sign up for this plan. What was I supposed to do? Does anyone really understand what's going on right now? Do you know who shows up? Our God. It says the angel of the Lord, which is sometimes commentators say a a symbol of the pre-incarnate Christ or Jesus. And and he shows up and and he says, you know what, Um, Hagar, I see you. In fact, that child, it's a blessing. You should name him Ishmael. And you know what Ishmael means? It means God hears. Because Hagar, when you thought no one saw and no one heard, I heard your misery. I knew exactly what was going on, and I'm here to assure you it works out in the end. I got your future. And so after this experience, Hagar, uh, she had words to say. Um, She said these words. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. What is our comfort? Right now, we are not alone because we have a God who sees and hears us. How great is the comfort of that God? There is nothing going on that he doesn't know of. No concern or fear in your head that he hasn't solved already. He's bigger than COVID-19. He's bigger than wars and rumors of wars. He's bigger than death, and he's with us. He knows and he hears. What other comfort could we draw? You know, one of the stories coming out of this whole thing is all the students who are studying abroad who are either stuck or had to get home. I was doing uh, some research over uh, one gal named Amanda Oland, and uh, she was in Copenhagen, and she couldn't go to Florence, uh, which because that's in Italy, and, um, and, and so um, she was trying to get home. And she was saying how the ticket skyrocketed, that a $500 ticket to get home uh, skyrocketed to over $1,000 very quickly. And I've heard of other students who, um, you know, are, are stuck in Italy and, and, and contracting con- coronavirus, And can you imagine if you were stuck in Italy in a foreign hospital with this virus? Think of how lonely you would feel. I'm just curious, has anyone ever been to a hospital in a foreign country? When they don't speak your language, man, that can be unsettling. But what I love 
is that our God is a helper. God knows how to help us in this time. God knows how to help the sick, those who need strength, those who need peace. In fact, in Psalm 91, it says we have an ever-present helper in our God. We are, we are not alone because he is that helper. One of my favorite psalms also is Psalm 139. I want you to look at these words. It says, if I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Let me translate it for today. If I go to Wuhan, China, you're there. If I make my bed in Italy, you're there. If I rise on the wings of Chicago, Illinois, if I settle on the far side of Frankfurt, Illinois, you're there. And it's not just that he's there. What does it go on to say? What, what is he doing? There your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. When no one else is there to help you, and when doctors don't have answers, he still does. Praise be to the God who is our help. Praise be to Jesus who ensured it to be so. So dear friends, no matter in the coming weeks or month how isolated you might feel, know that you have a God who has never left you or forsaken you. Know that you have a God who is there to help you in any and every need. And again, peace be with you. Amen.